also thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to tell you a bit about uh, what we're doing in Munich. Um, my, uh, I'm also a bit fortunate because my talk is right after Fabrice's talk, who introduced uh, the concept of uh, what's possible with two electron atoms uh, very nicely. And uh, then also uh, yesterday we heard from Christian Gross about uh, what's currently possible with fermionic uh, systems in, under uh, quantum gas microscopes. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is a bit of a mixture of both. Um, but I'm also not going to tell you anything because we don't really have a final experiment yet. We're still working on it. And uh, that is going to be the slightly technical part of this talk. And uh, I hope I can show you a bit about uh, what's actually involved in making these experiments work and uh, tell you um, where we think uh, 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 future improvements um, can be done. So. Um, this is a slide I uh, recycled from 2008, and uh, the, uh, uh, um, shows the electronic structure of, uh, of strontium here. So the, uh, you can see it's exactly the same uh, overall structure as ytterbium. So you have a singlet ground state, uh, first singlet excited state, and a laser cooling transition, which is uh, broad, uh, um, that couples those two. And you can uh, laser cool atoms down to the millikelvin regime using that transition. Then you typically switch over to a secondary cooling transition uh, to the first excited triplet state, which is seven kilohertz wide. And that allows you, in, in this particular atom, to cool atoms down to the microkelvin regime even. That's uh, one of the nice features of, of the strontium atom is that this line width is actually uh, really quite nice. So, And then the, um, the transition that caused a lot of excitement, which is also why I put this slide uh, about 10 years ago, or a bit more than that, is that it's possible to build optical frequency standards be, uh, based on the transition between um, the ground state here and the first excited triplet state. And uh, this relies on um, hyperfine coupling in fermionic isotopes of uh, two electron atoms. So in this case, we have a nuclear spin of 9 halves. And this results in a line width that is extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily narrow uh, and, and a line width of the triplet P0 state of about 150 seconds. No one's been able to resolve that yet. But that's why it uh, um, became very popular. And uh, um, in fact, uh, here are a few uh, ancient results by now uh, that uh, show you um, if you compare this frequency standard against the uh, definition of frequency and time, the cesium clock, uh, you can measure uh, this number. And this is still the best agreed upon optical frequency to date. And the reason is not that people haven't been working on it. Uh, the measurements actually got a lot better. But it's that the cesium standard is just not uh, uh, getting that much better anymore, and um, which is also why there's been a lot of discussion of actually replacing the cesium standard at some point soon with an optical standard. And strontium is one of the prime candidates for that. So because of all of this uh, excitement uh, today, there's uh, actually a lot of different research that people are um, doing with uh, strontium atoms. And it makes use of a lot of the concepts and the technology that uh, Fabrice also introduced. And uh, just a little selection of, uh, of experiments. Um, all of them are fairly recent. Uh, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. And uh, um, one exciting thing, for instance, about these atoms that Fabrice also alluded to is that the uh, ground state interactions uh, for these uh, atoms uh, don't actually care about the state of the nucleus. So if you have two um, atoms at ultra cold temperature colliding, uh, what really happens is that just the electronic shells overlap, you get strong repulsion due to the Pauli exclusion principle, and the nuclei never see each other. And that's why then in these uh, J equals 0, 2 electron atoms, we have a uh, um, SUN symmetric um, interaction. Or if you want to think about it that way, if you write down a Hamiltonian, then this Hamiltonian will be SUN symmetric. And that's exciting because, uh, where, oh, sorry, n is the uh, two, two times the number of um, two times uh, i plus 1, so in, in our case, 10. Um, and that's exciting because the SUN symmetry is, uh, of course, very prominent in high energy physics problems. And uh, that's why people are uh, very excited about using these atoms uh, to do quantum simulations of such problems or of uh, quantum field theory, say. There's also uh, something very similar that also Fabrice showed already. You can do spin orbit coupling. Um, something very different is you can also uh, um, put uh, these atoms into a cavity in the bad cavity limit and try to generate a, an active laser, an active oscillator based on them. So with the hope that you can get a millihertz line with a laser out of this that is not dependent on the boundary conditions here, the cavity, but really just uh, uses the features of the atoms. 
there's a project that's picking up speed in Florent Trex Group where uh, they're trying to develop a a uh, really continuous source of uh, ultra-cold and even quantum generated uh, strontium atoms, uh, also for applications in oops, atom interferometry. So here's the first uh, result very recent uh, on using building an atom interferometer based on uh, the clock transition. And again, here the, the hope is that you can use the extremely long coherence times to make very large areas for your atom interferometer and uh, thus um, get uh, enhanced resolution. People have uh, started playing around with Rydberg atoms of two electron systems. And here, the interesting part is simply that, well, if you have two electrons and you take one far away, then you still have one electron left that you can use to actually trap these things. So that's exciting. Uh, of course, if for a long time, it's been possible to do photo association of uh, uh, such um, atoms and make molecules. But now, uh, you can turn it around and uh, actually photo dissociate these molecules in uh, Tanya Zelewinski's group. And uh, that's cool because it's a very paradigma paradigmatic experiment in, in chemistry that can now be done at ultra-cold temperatures, meaning you can actually see uh, quantum effects in, in, in such experiments. What I particularly like is that um, the optical lattice clock is now um, approaching a regime where uh, it may actually be helpful to use a degenerate Fermi gas uh, as, a, as the atomic sample in this clock. And uh, there's some very recent results from, from Junier's group on that. So um, all of this is enabled by the concept of the magic wavelength. And Fabrice has already told you a lot about this. Uh, let me just rephrase this a bit in the language that you've heard at this workshop also. So what you want to do if you want to uh, uh, do good spectroscopy is, well, you would like to uh, do this with many atoms, because that enhances your signal to noise. Um, but uh, if you want to do spectroscopy on single atoms and just use many of them, you want to make them uh, be as identical as possible, right? Uh, this is problematic in a, an optical trap because uh, the, the AC Stark effect that generates these traps is state dependent, meaning uh, your internal and external degrees of freedom of the atom couple strongly, and that's bad. Uh, and then that was solved in the early 2000s by the concept of the magic wavelength uh, lattice where you know, it's magic because all your problems go away. And uh, you just are a bit clever, and you plot the polarizability, as you've seen from Fabrice. And if you, your two states um, cross, then you have the trap that looks the same to first order for both states. Okay, And again, in different language, what that means is that you decouple the uh, internal degrees of freedom of the atom from the external degrees of freedom of the atom as well as possible. And you use many atoms at the same time. Right? So an uh, alternative uh, way of viewing this, this is the very best optical qubit we have today. And um, you would like to make a, a pseudo-spin system. So it's also a pseudo-spin. You take many of them. You have a pseudo-spin system. And you do your very best job of not having these atoms interact, because that's bad. Okay? So, but since um, that's not what we're doing, we would like to do the opposite. We would actually like these things to interact again. And uh, I'll show you a bit about what the idea is. So here's our polarizability graph that you saw. Just to remind you, here's this red magic wavelength at uh, near IR. And if you make a dipole trap out of these um, at, at this wavelength, uh, both uh, atoms will be trapped um, in exactly the same uh, trapping potential. There's also uh, one in, uh, in blue detune from the main transition of strontium. And uh, that's interesting. Where the, again, the polarizability is cross, but with different sign which means that if you make a trap, the atoms are actually repelled from the intensity maxima. Or if you make a lattice, the uh, atoms would be trapped at the, um, uh, where there's no light. And that's uh, interesting for a variety of reasons. I'll come back to that, uh, especially because the lattice wavelength is 390 nanometer. And if you imagine making a lattice at this uh, wavelength, you would get atomic spacings of 200 nanometers. That, uh, I'll come back to that. So there's also anti-magic wavelengths that uh, uh, Fabrice showed. Uh, what I'm personally excited about are these two knot wavelengths. So if you if you look here, so you can find uh, wavelengths where um, uh, both of those states either you know are are nicely trapped or don't see the trap at all, and that allows you to do uh, the following scenario here, where uh, you can either trap the ground state and the excited state doesn't care, or you trap the uh, excited state and the ground state doesn't care. And if you combine those two, you get complete differential control over um, your system and. There's a, a lot of great ideas that you can immediately come up with. Let me show you just one of them. Uh, so here's a scenario that you, you know, without thinking too much, you can come up with. So let's say you make, a, make a, just a retroreflected retro optical lattice for the ground state. Uh, 
And uh, then you say um, you uh, use a high resolution imaging system and project an optical tweezer uh, with the, at this uh, ground state tune out so that the trap that only traps the excited state um, onto this lattice, then you can imagine if you co-propagate a clock laser, you can excite a single atom, say, and then you can simply start moving this thing around. And what you do there is you, by, by our collisions, you start entangling everything, anything you want. And you have a very good control over, over what you want to do. You can do interferometry schemes, anything like that. So that's um, our big picture goal. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, though, you do need very good uh, optical resolution such that you can focus down these traps to uh, small um, to small sizes. And uh, uh, to remind you, what Christian also showed is uh, in the in about 2010 or so, the uh, Bloch group and the Greiner group uh, simultaneously uh, developed these quantum gas microscopy techniques, where you could, for the first time, see. Um, uh, optical lattices and uh, with uh, bosonic rubidium in it uh, and uh, resolve them with single side resolution. And that's cool. We've heard a lot about what you can do with that. In uh, about five years later, uh, a whole variety of groups started then also um, getting this to work with fermionic atoms. And to remind you, because again, uh, uh, the, um, if someone is talking about fermionic uh, alkali metal atoms, there are really not many, many choices. There are two isotopes in the alkali metals that are fermions, and that's uh, potassium-40 and uh, lithium-6. And they each have their own issues, which is why it took a while to get, to get this to work. Uh, also, the isotope that Fabrice was talking about, excuse me, uh, this is bosonic ytterbium. Um, two Japanese groups very recently also got uh, microscopes to work for, for this. So if you stare a bit at the very best uh, fermionic systems that people are generating these days, uh, what you find is that people um, are making mod insulators. And uh, here's a sketch. They sort of look like this. You get a regular grid, grid of, uh, of atoms. And there's one atom per site, because again, we're talking about fermions now. And um, <clears throat> uh, the temperature ends up being something like half the, uh, um, the tunneling rate. So I'm call using little t here, where Fabrice used uh, j. And uh, then, then you can get these systems. And uh, um, <clears throat> we also see that they are fairly small, right? So you, in the end, you get, end up getting something like uh, 900 atoms or so, about uh, 10 to the 3 atoms, roughly. So this is still not all that cold. And uh, there's been a, a lot of very recent work where, oops, where um, you can then uh, play a trick that has been discussed for a while. And uh, if you simply subdivide your big system, well, your big system now into a, a, into a central area, and you work very hard at making this extremely homogeneous. And then you uh, uh, use a low density reservoir on the outside to dump your in uh, entropy into. You can get uh, antiferromagnets um, with a temperature that's de that are decreased by a factor of uh, two, roughly. And then you, uh, um, in the Griner group very recently, uh, they were able to f uh, realize the first such uh, 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 antiferromagnetic systems in 2D that actually look like an antiferromagnet. Um, but what you sacrifice here, that's my point a bit, is uh, you make these systems even smaller. So now you end up having about 80 atoms. And uh, the big uh, um, motivation for doing neutral atom uh, quantum simulation, and as we've also heard in this conference, is that uh, is scalability. So what about scalability here? So in the end, we have uh, about 80 uh, degenerate fermions, and that's great, but uh, maybe we want a bit, a few more of them. So how do you do that? Um, and the, as Fabrice also said, laser power is a big deal. Uh, the reason uh, this lithium-6 system that I just showed is this particular size uh, is that the uh, laser powers that you need to do uh, these trapping conditions, and especially these imaging conditions, uh, is as large as you can buy. So there is no way to buy any uh, higher laser powers at this moment, and this is exactly why the system is the size it is. Um, and it, the, the reason is that the uh, Gaussian beam shape of the uh, lattice beams simply um, defines a varying chemical potential in your system, and that's why the system requires a finite size. Now, <clears throat> if you can't get bigger lasers, uh, a simple idea would be to maybe uh, use a cavity and retroreflect your laser beam many times back and forth to enhance your laser power. 
So and that's what we're trying to investigate. Um, and the reason is that if we plot something uh, for, for strontium using this build-up cavity that we have in mind, uh, we should be able to get a system that is significantly larger. Now, um, even, I mean, there are all kinds of issues with uh, going to very large systems then, but just thinking about taking this and making maybe the blue circle even a bit smaller again, then you would get a much more homogeneous system than is currently possible, and that then should lead to, at least it should be possible to engineer lower entropies and maybe do higher fidelity quantum simulations in, in that language. Um, so this is plotted for uh, an infrared lattice, um, but also if we then dream a bit and say this also could work for this blue detuned magic wavelength lattice that I showed you, then you could get lattice spacings that are significantly smaller, uh, and you don't have to sacrifice so much in the beam size to get systems that are even larger. Um, so how do you do that? Now, now comes the really uh, technical part, and here's uh, where um, you, know, you have to look a bit at how people actually do things. So uh, if you want to build a cavity around your ultra-cold atom uh, um, apparatus, how do you typically do that? Well, you, let's say you have a, a glass cell. This is this, this half thing here. And uh, uh, there's vacuum in here, and your atoms live in the center. And you have made this very nice imaging objective on top, so you can actually see what you're doing. Uh, and then you want to build a cavity around it. Well, what you do is you place uh, two mirrors on kinematic mounts around this and you uh, align it carefully and you retroreflect your beam many times back and forth. So um, I said these cavities are great because they give you all kinds of great features, but that is really only true as long as you actually manage to stabilize this laser to the cavity resonance, right? If, you are, if I'm not on the cavity resonance and I get no laser light in and, uh, well, nothing happens. Um, also means, well, that you know, this cavity enhances the power, but with great power comes, well, great sensitivity to everything, and uh, especially to vibrations from these kinematic mounts. Uh, there's also, you can see there's glass in between uh, the cavity mode, and uh, the, this leads to losses, stress induced by refringence, and generally also means that your cavities have to be fairly long, just because you have to put it around something. So people have tried this, of course, and it tends to not work so well. I mean, it works, but not particularly uh, great. So the, uh, my idea, or what I would like to sell you, is that uh, we can take a cue from uh, how we construct uh, laser cavities for these very good reference lasers for optical clocks. And you just um, look at a list of how that's actually done. And um, here's, a, here's a sketch. So you see this, this uh, uh, glass body, and then you can see these mirrors, four mirrors, uh, uh, optically contacted to it. So in, in this sort of construction, it's, it's completely monolithic. There's no tuning. That's, that's bad, right? So you can't really align anything like here. Uh, you also have to actually optically bond uh, these glass pieces together. So this really becomes a single uh, glass body. Uh, you can't glue it. Um, if you use ultra-low expansion glass materials, like in, in these reference cavities, then this can be actually quite good. Um, you should put that in vacuum, and you should really worry a bit about uh, vibration isolation and, and, and thermal management. Okay, so this is the technical stuff. So vibrations, again, and it's maybe from a conceptual standpoint, uh, is interesting to you. Um, so if you play around a bit with the finite element solver and, and this geometry, you can actually engineer this such that these vibrations, which what they do, right? If this, if this cavity uh, shakes, then the cavity length changes, or and... Uh, that also uh, causes your optical lattice to shake and this heats your atoms out. That has been the problem for, for most people who try this. Um, but if you play around with the, uh, uh, with the geometry and use a very high quality factor material like these glasses, then uh, you can engineer these um, vibrational modes, the lowest one, to be out of band with your system energy scales. And uh, the system energy scales that you typically have in these fermionic mod insulators are simply given by how, how high can you crank the interaction energy. So Fabrice also showed that uh, the, um, the energy scales for these systems are very slow. So uh, you can get, uh, if you're good or if you uh, work hard, you can get a few kilohertz, uh, maybe a bit more, but that's about it. And that then sets everything else because you then uh, to get a mod insulator, you want the tunneling matrix element to be about 10% roughly of this interaction energy. And then this also here, my J is a, the super exchange energy sets that as well. Um, but if you look here, if we get a few kilohertz here, uh, this is much higher. So we, there's some hope of making this work well. Um, you want to worry about how to design your mirrors. 
the good thing is we don't have to, uh, we simply want to define a good cavity mode with, um, uh, that looks nice and has high enough power to do what we want and is large, uh, such that we don't really, uh, we're not really interested in doing cavity QED type experiments, which means that the uh, power buildups that we are considering are on the order of a few hundred to a few thousand only. And that means you can actually design uh, optical coatings that work for a variety of wavelengths. And I showed you in the beginning that there are a variety of interesting wavelengths for the strontium atom that you may want to play with, including these two knot wavelengths here, this ND magic wavelength, the blue uh, uh, magic wavelength, the red magic wavelength, another red magic one, and even if you have a laser around 1064. Um, turns out that works. We've measured all that, and that, that, that's fine. Um, so what's difficult about this? Why has no one done this? Uh, the, the difficult part is that, of course, I've mentioned we can't actually do anything to it. Once you build it, it has no tuning. You have to start uh, designing this from uh, the very beginning because you have to put it in vacuum. That's all technically challenging and so on. But the real uh, issue is you can see here how there's actually two cavity modes. And um, I mentioned that we would like to have homogeneous systems, which also means that these cavity modes have to actually overlap. And uh, that is uh, very hard, and typically people don't worry about that for uh, optical cavity design. And the reason is that the, um, uh, if you want to make a cavity with large modes, um, you can think about your classical fabi perot interferometer with uh, plain mirrors, right? And you know that any field configuration will fit in there. Uh, it's not what we want, because we would like to define a well-defined um, uh, Hamid Gaussian beam that we can use. So you go a bit away from that condition, and you make, uh, uh, instead of having infinite curvature on one side, you make it a bit curved. And if you make it you know, 10 meters or 20 meters of curvature, then uh, the, the, the cavity mode sizes that we're going to get are something like half a millimeter uh, waist. Yeah, so a millimeter size, size beam, macroscopic things. Uh, that also means, unfortunately, that the, um, that the uh, mode becomes, the position of the mode becomes more undefined. Because the, you can see here, if you buy a, a piece of glass, you have to worry a bit about the, um, the parallelism between these two surfaces. And uh, the best you can get someone to do for you is something like an arc second. And uh, um, there will always be a mode between those two mirrors. But you can see that it's defined by the normal vector of this plane mirror and uh, then the radius of curvature of, uh, of the secondary mirror, and the, the displacement is given by this angle times the radius, not the length of the cavity, which then makes it really quite challenging to not only get two uh, modes through these holes, but also then actually overlap that. So that's what we're working on. Um, what's the status? So here you can see our test piece. Uh, the uh, cavity spaces we have figured out, that's working. The coding run is also working, like I showed you. You also want to. Here in this test piece, the mirrors are still glued. You can see a bit of glue here. That doesn't work. So we have to contact them to the, uh, to the spacer, which means you need to machine off a, a flat surface in this, uh, in this mirror. That's something we've been working on for a while. That's now working. You have to optically contact. We think we know how to do that. We also know how to measure the mode overlap in the end. Uh, we still have to figure out two things, and that's a re remaining wedge error uh, in, in the machining of this annulus. And we have to work a bit on the uh, precision with which we can op do optical contacting. That's also something that people typically don't, don't do like that. So that's the, the big technical background to what we want to do. And um, uh, I think that's typically what, what you don't hear in these talks is that all this effort that has to go into something like this. Um, of course, that's not the only thing we're doing. But uh, we've also, this is our vacuum system as it looks currently. There's a lot of technical enhancements that are maybe not so important right now. What is important is, is that we've measured the, the lifetime in this vacuum chamber over here to be better than a minute in a magnetic trap. And that, uh, that will help us to also work with the uh, rare bosonic isotope of strontium that we would like to address as well. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to summarize. So, what we would like to do, and, uh, and uh, as you've seen, there, are, there were already great introductions at this conference um, from both Fabrice and Christian, is to combine these two fields of, and try to do um, quantum many body physics in, under a microscope with uh, two electron atoms. Uh, one thing we're excited about is the prospect of using blue detuned magic wavelengths because you can get such small spacings, and that nonlinearly increases your system energies. As I said, that sets everything like as, much, as, high, uh, uh, as high as you can get the interaction uh, uh, as good you, uh, well, the more you can do. Uh, 
Um, there is, are also uh, tune-out wavelengths that we are addressing, and I think it uh, would be very exciting to try something with that. Uh, we would also like to go to larger systems, and again, uh, the main point here is not that you really want larger systems, but that if you then cut out a small part of it, it will be much more homogeneous, such that then you can talk about doing high-fidelity quantum simulations. Um, also reduces your dependence on the local density approximation for the analysis of such systems. Um, things we have on our minds are trying to do uh, interferometry experiments, like I showed, with using these state-dependent traps. Um, we you know, you can easily see that, as I showed, you can take an excited state atom and move it around to create entanglement, maybe also measure it. Uh, one thing you can also do is, as Fabrice said, the clock transition in bosons doesn't exist. You have to induce it with a magnetic field to mix the, the states. Uh, so you can imagine actually embedding an excited state fermion in a bath of ground state bosons, if, that, uh, if you can get that to work, and you should be able to see something there. Uh, and one thing that is enabled by these large systems that is uh, really a bit unique is the, an idea um, that one could maybe even do quantum simulation of nanophotonics where the, uh, the freely propagating atoms in, um, in say, the ground state uh, mimic the, um, the propagating photons. And if you, can, if you can engineer the band structure of these almost freely propagating atoms, then you can engineer band structures of photons. And the excited and trapped atoms would then uh, correspond to, to the vacuum. And uh, the interesting part here would be that you could reach uh, coupling strengths and, uh, and cooperativities that are difficult to do in real nanophotonic systems. Uh, of course, um, I can't do that by myself. So uh, I have a great team here. And uh, these are two grad students who are leading this research, is uh, Andre Heinz and Annie Park. Sepan is a wonderful postdoc who's also working with us. And this is all done in Emmanuel Bloch's uh, group. And of course, there are many, many interns and master students who are also contributing. So thank you very much.